Um, the president has since gone on to uh, take you into a successful business. So please help, help me welcome Justin. So the subject of this talk is less green than the 2000 feet, and we first got interested in electric bicycles. Um, so it was around the era where modern rechargeable batteries, nickel metal hydride, and then lithium was the most popular in the world of batteries. And uh, ever since getting involved in this scene, I've had uh, zero interest in working with lead acid battery packs just because it felt like the technology of the previous century. And Um, so that set me off on a course where I spent much of the last seven years working with batteries, uh, whether I wanted to or not. Um, and this whole discussion is going to be me unloading <laughs> everything I've learned and a lot of the hard lessons that have come along the way. Um, and I hope it's informative for both of for everyone who's here. Um, and when I'm not talking about lead batteries, it really leads to other chemistries of mainstream interest. Those are nickel-based battery packs that you see in the middle there, the nickel cadmium and nickel metal hydride, and then many flavors of lithium batteries. Um, so uh, it said that I need no introduction, but uh, we've got a quick summary there. I was in uh, engineering physics at the University of British Columbia with an interest in electronics and power electronics specifically. Um, and it was in one of my senior years here that we started the electric light club with uh, several of my classmates, I believe one of whom is in the photo and sitting right over there, I'm sure Josh Usher. Um, so we uh, um, had a, a goal of both pursuing our own electric vehicle projects for student uh, senior engineering design courses and then promoting and spreading awareness about electric bikes both on campus and in Vancouver and the community at large. Um, that didn't last very long since most of us were in our senior years and the club of students was when this was no longer a student. Um, so in the following year, uh, some of us morphed that into a business which uh, had various incarnations with Texacans, and some of the companies, currently Grin Technologies, but always been run under the webpage uh, domain ebikes.ca, which is how we're typically known. Um, and the goal of our business has been to supply electric bicycles, conversion parts, as well as design and engineer components to be used to requisite a bike to have electric assist. One of those key conversion parts, of course, is the battery. And over the last seven years, we've had about 1,700 batteries go through our shop. Um, probably 500 of them, 400 of them, have some kind of troubles along the way. <laughs> and, uh, and it's those troubles that you're going to hear all about very shortly. And I should warn you that I have a, a background in electronics and physics, but I'm not a chemist. And the, there's a whole lot of battery theory and battery technology that is all about chemistry. Batteries are 100% about chemistry, and to me, the chemistry aspect is a bit of a mystery. I don't even know the basic equations that go on. Um, <laughs> it wasn't always going to be that way. There was a time when I actually wanted to be a chemist, and, uh, and in high school, I was doing all sorts of electrochemistry chemistry experiments, learning about anodes and cathodes and redox reactions, um, doing electrochemical synthesis. This is my first anti hour meter, um, used purely for keeping track of how much current flows through electrochemical cells, and these were used to synthesize chemicals. Um, at the time, not used for powering vehicles so much as blowing them up. And to say, they, um, a lot of chemical energy that can be extracted through uh, electronics and, and chemistry and the battery and extracting that in a controlled electrical manner um, so back in 2003, I started reading and learning about electric bicycles. I got extremely excited about it. Um, I was a student, I was poor, I loved finding things in dumpsters, and I found a bunch of laptop batteries um, at a surplus store for $5 each. And I was trying to figure out how to get myself an electric bicycle on about a $200 budget. So I bought 10 of these at $50 and thought that was it. The most expensive thing I've got mailed for $50, and I just have left the source, the motor, and that. Uh, you have your component, and uh, I was able to get a used hub motor, strap the batteries on, use the multi meter as my implementation. Um, and that is the bike that excited both myself and tons of other fellow students and professors at UBC and started this uh, entity that we have now. Um, but the battery became an area that, of great intrigue, I'll say. 
Um, and so that reading and learning about batteries is learning that if you have an old battery, a, a nickel metal hydride battery, which is laptop cells where they don't perform very well after they've been in storage for a while, and they need several cycles to condition them. And I wanted to know how much performance that's going to get out of this electric bike. So I built my first battery testing circuit. Um, and so this is around 2004. All the circuitry at the bottom is homemade, and then this is a power supply from a uh, piece of electronics that was in one of the UVC dumpsters. The next circuit was connected to a laptop that could charge and discharge those laptop batteries that had bought for five dollars each, so that I would know how they were performing if there were bad or dead cells in the mix, and try to get an optimum path for my first electric bicycle. Um, so there it is, the alligator clutch cycle in the battery. Um, and then that, the end results showed that the theory that I had been reading about on the internet and on this book, uh, Batteries in a Portable Universe, in a portable world, um, panned out. And you can see in the first discharge of that battery pack, I got three quarters of an half hour. And the second discharge, did one and a half. And each time it cycled, it kept improving in its capacity until eventually leveling off about two amp hours. Uh, so I knew what the batteries could deliver. When I then looked at the specs on those cells, they were supposed to be 3.3 amp hour cells. So I also knew that they were only delivering 65% of what a cell was originally supposed to deliver. Now these were new <coughs> surplus batteries. They'd never been used, but just by aging, by sitting around being unused for several years before I finally wound up with them, they'd already lost a third of their capacity. Um, so, uh, actually at this point, I'm gonna give you guys a bit of a theory section on nickel-based charging and discharge characteristics. Um, and what we see here is the discharge curves of just a single nickel-based cell. And this is the same as nickel metal hydride or nickel cadmium. Um, it starts off at about one and a half volts, and then it sits very flat for most of the discharge at 1.2 volts. And then once you're about 90% discharge, it starts to roll off and then very rapidly plummets at 100%. The cell is completely flat. Um, if you discharge it at a higher current, which would be the blue curve, then you have less voltage, but you still get more or less the same amount of energy out of the battery pack. And the temperature increases more when you discharge it at a higher current. Um, where nickel gets very, very interesting is in the charging characteristics. So what you see here is the blue and the green are both showing the voltage that you see on a nickel cell as you charge the battery. So when we start it off in the corner here, the battery's flat. It's sitting at less than one volt. And then as we put current into the battery, the voltage goes up, and we see kind of the reverse of the discharge curve. But then once you get to 100% charge, when you think the battery would be fully charged and ready to be discharged, um, a few uh, interesting things start to take place. First is that the temperature, which is just gradually going up when you charge the battery, starts to skyrocket and rises quite rapidly. Well, the temperature goes up, um, the voltage starts to go up beforehand. So just before 100% charge, the voltage goes from like 1.3 volts per cell quite rapidly up to 1.5 or 1.6 volts. But then the voltage starts to decrease again. And as the battery gets warmer, the voltage on that cell goes down. Um, and that means the way in which you determine when a, a nickel-based cell is charged, um, you can't just charge it up to a certain voltage. Just say you put, charge it up to this voltage here, this was the voltage of your, your battery charger. As the cell charged up, it would never quite hit that voltage, and then it would start to overcharge, and the overcharge, the voltage would go further, allowing more charge current into the battery, and you get a binary reaction. So the, when it came to me packing together this homemade battery pack, I then needed